to everything except for zero. We can add, we can subtract, we can multiply, we can divide for whatever suitable definition of those things that we have. So there's a lot of rich structure behind finite fields. Some of them you already know. For instance, you're already familiar at this point with the idea that the group Z mod PZ, where P is a prime number, is additively and multiplicatively a field because everything has a multiplicative inverse except for zero. But what you might not know is that there are other examples of finite fields besides the cyclic groups Z mod P. So in this video, we're going to take a look at a couple of those examples and maybe give a general hint as to how you can construct a finite field and what limitations the restriction of being a field places on what finite fields can look like. So first of all, Here's an example of a finite field that is not one of our familiar Z mod PZs. So we're going to build this by starting with four elements. Let's call them 0, E, A, and B, where 0 is going to play the role of our additive identity. E is going to play the role of our multiplicative identity. And then A and B are just other elements. So we're going to start with this set of four elements. And we're going to first say that additively, each of these elements has order 2. So if I add any of these elements to itself, we end up with the uh, additive identity. So what is this additively but the Klein 4 group? And to really demonstrate that, we can set up an isomorphism between F4, which is what I'm going to call this, and the Klein 4 group itself, which is made up of Z mod 2 crossed with Z mod 2. Uh, and this isomorphism is just going to send 0 to 0, 0, and E to 1, 1, and then A and B are sent to the 1, 0, and 0, 1 elements. So this correspondence is actually a homomorphism from F4 to the Klein 4 group. And because it's 1 to 1 and on to, that also makes it a group isomorphism. So as groups, F4 is isomorphic to the Klein 4 group. But what about the multiplicative structure? Do we multiply things inside of F4 the same way that we would multiply elements in Z2 crossed with Z2? Well, it turns out that that's not the case that our F4 actually has a different multiplicative structure than the Klein 4 group would have if we multiplied Klein 4 elements component-wise. For instance, let's take 1, 0, and 0, 1, and I multiply them together component-wise. I would end up with 0, 0 under the usual multiplication on uh, the integers mod 2. But if I take their corresponding elements that we identified from F4 and multiply those together, I don't get 0, 0. So one way of saying this is that if we try multiplying in the Klein 4 group by components, we actually have 0 divisors. 1, 0, and 0, 1 multiplied together give me 0, 0. But we don't have 0 divisors in the multiplication table that we've set up here. So we have a different multiplicative structure. In fact, if we look at it more closely, the multiplicative structure, the multiplication table down at the lower left, actually shows that the, uh, the group of units of this particular field um, is isomorphic to Z mod 3, that multiplicatively every element here has order 3. So this leads us to the first uh, definition of working with a finite field. That um, because in order for a field to be finite, we have to put some limitation on the number of times that we can add an element to itself before it goes away. So the definition is that the characteristic of a field is how many times we can take the unity element of that field and add it to itself before eventually we end up back around at 0. So for z mod 4, or z mod 9, or z mod 18, or whatever, uh, we know that if we have the generator 1, we add it to itself 4, 9, or 18 times, and we end up back at 0. So this is a definition we're going to carry with us into our study of fields, and we're going to call it the characteristic of a field, the smallest such number n, such that when I add 1 to itself n times, I get back around to 0. Now, not every field has such a positive value for n. For instance, in the rational numbers, or the real numbers, we can add 1 to itself infinitely many times and never get to 0. So if that's the case, we're going to say that our field has characteristic 0. So in the previous example of F4 that we looked at, which was additively the Klein 4 group, but multiplicatively Z mod 3, what was the characteristic in that group? Well, to find out, we just take its additive, uh, sorry, its multiplicative identity element, E, and start adding it to itself. So if we add it to itself twice, it turns out immediately, because additively it was the Klein 4 group, we end up back at 0. So we would say that the characteristic of the field that we looked at on the previous slide was 2. Now the first thing we can say about the characteristic of a field in a definite sense is that let's take a look at what happens if that characteristic were a composite number. Let's say we tried to have a field whose characteristic were 6. Okay. Then if the characteristic of this field were 6, then I would add 1 to itself. Actually, these n's here should be e's or, or 1, so let me just fix that real quick. So if I add 1 to itself 6 times and I get 0, then by grouping together pairs of those 1's, let's say I group them by 2's or something like that, then I'm going to find out that 2 multiplied by 3 gives me 0 in this so-called field 
So if I have a composite characteristic in my field, then I can group together ones and show that that actually gives rise to a zero divisor. And so we won't have a field after all, because a field, by its definition, everything besides zero is a unit and therefore cannot be a zero divisor. So if n is composite, then our field has zero divisors, which means that if we're, then it means it's not a field at all, right? So that means that any field at all, its characteristic, if it's not zero, has got to be a prime number. So that's a proof of a, this little theorem here, that those fields whose characteristic are zero are going to be our infinite fields. And any field which is finite is going to have a characteristic that is a prime number. Okay. So sometimes um, algebraists will use the phrase field of positive characteristic to refer to a finite field. A corollary of that, and this takes a little bit of explaining, is that if I have a field of positive characteristic, then that field is a vector space over the field z mod p. So we know z mod p is a field, but every finite field with a positive characteristic is a vector space over z mod p, where p is the characteristic of that field. So going back to what this actually means, it means that z mod p acts as the scalar multiplication in this so-called vector space. So what this means, for example, in our example of f4. So for f4, because the characteristic was 2, what we're claiming here is that z mod 2 can act like scalar multiplication in this field. So in other words, we should be able to say what it means to multiply by 0. We should also be able to say what it means to multiply by 1. Well, multiplying by 0 should mean exactly what we think it means. It kills everything. And multiplying by 1 means what we think it means. It should preserve everything. But that this operation distributes over the addition in our field um, actually makes f4 a vector space over z mod 2. In pictures, what does this look like? Well, let's suppose that we have the elements a and b. And a and b are independent of one another somehow. Um, and then we also have their sum. a plus b was e in our field. Um, and the fact that this kind of looks an awful lot like a vector space, except that it has only four elements in total. And the reason it has four elements in total is that we have kind of a, a two-element basis, a and b. And then we have a scalar multiplication field with only two elements in it. So we have 0 and 1 times a and b. And then we also have the sum of a and b. So what f4 really is as a vector space is it's a two-dimensional vector space over the field z mod 2. And so that makes it isomorphic to z mod 2 squared. And the linear transformation that establishes that isomorphism is exactly the same correspondence we saw a couple of slides ago. And a corollary to that is that because any finite field is going to be a finite dimensional vector space over z mod p, that means by the tenets of linear algebra that it's going to be isomorphic to some power of z mod p. And therefore, it must have p to the n elements in it. And again, the reasoning for this is the principles of linear algebra. If f is finite dimensional over the field z mod p, then that means that there is an isomorphism from f to the sum power, let's say the nth power of z mod p. And so that means that there are n, sorry, p to the n total elements in that field. What is this isomorphism? It's just a choice of a basis for f. So in our previous example, that basis was a and b. Um, but in more generality, we could be choosing a different basis and get a different isomorphism. But all those isomorphisms are somehow the same. So the big takeaway from this is that every finite field has a prime power number of elements. So this includes the uh, modular groups z mod p, but it also includes other fields that are not z mod p, um, but which still have a prime power, p to the n, number of elements. So in our last example with f4, that was a prime power 2 squared. Um, and additively, it was the Klein 4 group, but multiplicatively, it had a more interesting structure. So what we're going to do to round out this video is take a look at how to construct finite fields uh, in more generality by taking quotients of polynomial rings. So let's take a look at this field of characteristic 3. So what I've done here is taken the polynomial ring over z mod 3. So this is the, uh, the ring of all polynomials whose coefficients are in z mod 3. So we're going to think, just for the sake of, of being able to write down things as quickly as possible, we're going to think of z mod 3 as having the numbers minus 1, 0, and 1, representing the residue classes modulo 3. So this is all polynomials whose coefficients are negative 1, 0, or 1. And then we're ultimately going to take a quotient of that. But first, let's write down some of the elements that are in z mod 3 adjoined t. So we have a bunch of polynomials here that are uh, constants, 0, 1, and minus 1. And then we also have the linear polynomials, starting with t and going to t plus 1 and minus t and so forth. And there are a total of nine of those. And then we also have a bunch of quadratics. And we would have cubics and quartics and so on and so on. But 
what we're going to do to take this polynomial ring and hopefully make it into a field is take a quotient by the ideal generated by t squared plus 1. So I'm just picking t squared plus 1 as something I'm going to take a quotient by. And a reminder what this quotient means, that in the quotient, two polynomials are equivalent, equal, if their difference belongs to this ideal, t squared plus 1. In other words, if their difference is a multiple of t squared plus 1 inside of the polynomial ring over z mod 3. In particular, what this is going to mean for our calculations is that t squared plus 1 itself now becomes equivalent to 0. So one of the ways of understanding what the elements in this quotient are is to take t squared plus 1 wherever we see it and just get rid of it. So that makes t squared plus 1 equal to 0 in the quotient. What does it make t squared? Well, t squared is t squared plus 1 minus 1. And so crossing out the t squared plus 1, we find out t squared is the same as minus 1 in the quotient. And then t squared plus t is the same thing as minus 1 plus t and so on. So what it shows is that while these nine polynomials of degrees 0 and 1 that we wrote down cannot be reduced any further in the quotient, as soon as we have a t squared in one of the elements of our quotient, we can get rid of it. So everything which is smaller degree than 2, every constant and linear polynomial is in what we might call lowest terms, but everything with a t squared in it can be reduced. So for example, if I have some other bigger polynomial in z mod 3 adjoined t, maybe this one of degree 6, and I want to reduce it, then I'm just going to try to get everything down in terms of t squared, and then every t squared can be replaced by a negative 1. And when all of that dust is settled, we'll find out what uh, coset, if you like, or what representative in the quotient uh, this polynomial corresponds to. What about as a vector space? So as a vector space, we have um, kind of these two linearly independent polynomials to start with, the degree 1 polynomial 1, or sorry, the degree 0 polynomial 1, and the degree 1 polynomial t. And then we also have all of the sums of that and the opposites of that, because again, z mod 3 is acting on this, on this set. So here are our nine elements arranged to sort of see it as a vector space over z mod 3. And this vector space over z mod 3 has a basis of 1 and t. So the constant polynomials are kind of on the x-axis here. The multiples of t are on the y-axis. And then everything else is somewhere in between. So this is a two-dimensional vector space over the field z mod 3. In fact, we can also see z mod 3 itself hiding as a subfield inside of z3 adjoined t right here. In fact, it's just our x-axis if we're viewing this in sort of a vector space lens. Finally, what about the multiplicative structure inside of this? thing that we claim is a field. So one way of getting a handle on the multiplicative structure might be to just brute force it and come up with a multiplication table for the residue classes in this, uh, in this group. Well, we could do that. It would take us a really long time, because there are nine elements here, so we'd have to fill in 81 different entries. Um, we could get, you know, we know what multiplication by 0 is. We know what multiplication by 1 is. And then after that, you know, there's a lot. And I really don't want to go through all of that effort. So the question that I want to ask is, is this a field? How do we know it's a field? How do we know, for instance, that everything has an additive, sorry, multiplicative inverse? So what would the multiplicative inverse of t plus 1 be? Well, let's just try something. Suppose I take t plus 1 and I multiply it by itself to see if t plus 1 is its own multiplicative inverse. Well, once I do that and I reduce by getting rid of the t squared plus 1, I find out this product is equal to minus t. It's not equal to 1. So t plus 1 is not its own inverse. But maybe through some lucky guessing, I can find out t minus 1 in fact is the multiplicative inverse for t plus 1. So t plus 1 has a multiplicative inverse. And then we would have to go through all the other elements that are not 0 and show that they all have multiplicative inverses as well. But I want to be more efficient. This is the reason that we learn the abstraction in abstract algebra, is that we know that a quotient of a ring by one of its ideals is a field exactly when that ideal is a maximal ideal. So we want to know, is the ideal generated by t squared plus 1 maximal? Well, an ideal generated by an element in a ring, a commutative ring, is maximal if and only if that element is irreducible. Because if it's not irreducible, then it belongs to uh, it belongs to a field. Sorry, an ideal generated by one of its factors. So the real question at issue is: Is t squared plus one irreducible over z mod three? And that's equivalent to the question of whether or not it has any roots inside of z mod 3. Because if it has a root, then we can factor out a factor um, from t squared plus 1. So now this just boils it down to all we have to do is check to see if t squared plus 1 equals 0 has a solution for t equals negative 1, t equals 0, and t equals 1. Those we can check directly. Negative 1 squared plus 1 is negative 1. 0 squared plus 1 is 1. 1 squared plus 1 is negative 1. Again, these are all computations in z mod 3. But since none of these come out to 0, we find that this polynomial does indeed have no solution over z mod 3, and therefore is irreducible over z mod 3, and therefore the ideal is maximal. Therefore, this thing actually is a field.
So this actually generalizes quite nicely to show how we can construct a finite field with any prime power number of elements that we want. First we choose our characteristic, in this case it was 3, and we start with a polynomial ring over z mod p, where p is that characteristic. Then we take the quotient by an irreducible polynomial. And the degree of that irreducible polynomial shows us the power in our prime power. So here it was an irreducible quadratic polynomial over z mod 3. And so our prime power was 3 to the second power, which is 9. So we've constructed here a field of 9 elements. Its multiplicative structure is not at all obvious. Um, and it's definitely not the same as, for instance, z mod 9 would be, because z mod 9 has 0 divisors. But it is interesting, and it's one of the first examples of a finite field um, that is not something that we would have expected it to be if we were just looking at the modular groups.